Hi, I'm Glyn Jewis, and this is my Creating Compelling Time Lapses class for the Lightroom Virtual Summit. the software. So in this class, I want to take you through all that you need to know so that you can start getting out and creating your own time lapses. We're going to look at the kit, the settings that you need, and also how to put it together in the software, but also some extra little techniques that will really lift the creativity and the final result of your time lapse. So what is a time lapse? Basically, a time lapse is a series of photographs taken at regular intervals over an extended period of time. And that extended period of time could be five minutes, it could be five months, or even longer. When the photographs are then viewed in the form of a video, they show time zipping by. And this is how in nature programs we see a plant sprout from the soil and grow into full bloom in just a matter of seconds. Or in videos where we see clouds racing by in the background. You could also compare time lapses as to how artists used to create cartoons. First of all, drawing individual pictures on pages of a sketchbook and then flicking through those pages to reveal movement. There is so much that we can do with time lapses, be they standalone videos or forming part of the content of another video to add atmosphere, mood and pace.
So let's kick off and look at the kit that we're going to need. Now these days a lot of our mobile phones have the ability to create time lapses and that's great fun and great for a quick fix. However, when we use our proper cameras, that gives us way more control. Now it's safe to say that uh, most of the cameras we get these days have the ability to take photographs over an extended period of time so that we can create a time lapse. Now it may vary what they call it within your menu system, so make sure that you check in the manual but in my instance, I've got a Sony a7R4 and it's called interval shooting. No matter what it's called though, no matter where you find it in the menu, what we want to be able to do is to capture individual photographs so that we can then import those into Lightroom, edit them, and then create a time lapse that has the look and feel that we want. Now, if your camera will only take the photographs but also insists on making the time lapse inside it, you're going to need an extra piece of kit, and that's something called an intervalometer. Now, these are pretty much just like your basic cable release, but they've got a few more additions to them that allow you to set how many photos to take or how long to take photographs. And they're not expensive. You can get one that will do exactly what you want for around about £15 off Amazon. Now the other piece of essential kit you're going to need is a tripod or something that you can attach your camera to to ensure that it is rock steady and not wobbling around in between the actual individual pictures that it's taking. When it comes to movement, the only movement really that you want to have in your time lapse is the content of the scene of what's happening in front of your camera or actual movement that you physically put into the actual uh, time lapse by using another piece of hardware. And the kind of hardware I'm talking about is something called maybe a slider. Now I've got my own slider here. And what happens is that you attach your camera to it so it's nice and secure. And as each individual photograph is taken, the slider, because it's got a motor in it, moves ever so slightly. So that when you see that final time lapse, not only do you see the content within the video actually moving as it would do, you also get this really cool kind of panning action going left to right or up and down or at an angle depending on how you've positioned that particular slider. But of course that does mean more kit which means more expense. There is a way that we can fake it in the post processing of the time lapse which is why it's great to have the control of everything and I'm going to show you that in a short while in the post processing part of this class. Uh, but whatever you do, the only movement you want to have is from the content of the scene or movement that you've used a bit of hardware to create. What you don't want to have is your camera wobbling ever so slightly in between each of the individual photographs because then when you view the time lapse, things are going to start moving. It's going to jump around a bit and it just is not going to look good. Let's now take a look at the actual camera settings. Now we're going to use our cameras in manual mode and the reason for this is because if we use something like aperture priority, as the lighting conditions change over the time the camera is taking the photographs, the camera is going to adjust its shutter speed to get what it thinks the exposure should be. Now if you're doing this in a consistently lit indoor area such as I did with this clock, then no problem, the lighting isn't going to change so aperture priority would not be a problem. But if you're outdoors, the camera will want to make the scene brighter as the evening comes in, which isn't what we want. We want to see the natural change in the light. When it comes to focusing, my preferred choice is to use manual focus. And the reason for this is again mainly thinking about doing those extended time lapses outdoors. As the light gets darker, the camera could start to struggle with focus or actually, if a subject walks across the frame, that too could affect the focus. So the best and most safest bet is to use manual focus. You certainly don't want to be risking any change in the focus point if you're doing extended time lapses. So all you would need to do is use autofocus to first of all lock onto some content within the scene and then turn on manual focus. That way, no matter what, the camera is never going to hunt because it's already locked onto something and nothing is going to change that. So once we've turned our cameras into manual mode and we're using manual focus, let's just dive into a little bit more of the menus within the camera itself. And obviously this will vary depending on your brand of camera, but you'll be able to find these settings within there somewhere. 
Now, when it comes to the file format of shooting the individual images, I always use the RAW format. Storage is much more affordable these days, so I always set my camera to capture RAW files. You could use JPEG, but as I edit the images before creating the time lapse, I much prefer the flexibility that RAW gives, and of course, the extra information and detail that it captures. Moving further down, we've got the aspect ratio. Now, mo as most of the time lapses I create are going to be used in videos, which are generally in the widescreen 16 by 9 format, that's the format that I go for. So I change the aspect ratio to 16 9. The drive mode, we're going to go for single shooting because I only want one picture taken at each interval. I don't want there to be a burst of photographs taken. Navigating then through to where the actual interval shooting, the actual part of the menu that controls the photos that are taken for the time lapse. Uh, here you can see on my Sony, they've got the menu system. It starts off at the top saying interval shooting where I can turn it on or off. And then as we move down, we've got shooting start time. Now this is the amount of time you want the camera to wait after you've activated the shutter, before it starts taking photographs. Now I generally set mine to around five seconds to allow for any movement that may be in the camera from me touching it. It allows that to go so by the time I move away, the five seconds have gone, the camera starts taking the pictures and it is absolutely rock steady with no wobbling. We've then got shooting interval. How long a gap should the camera wait in between taking each of the photographs? Now this will often depend on the speed of the objects or the content within the scene. Too long a gap between shots when your scene contains fast moving objects such as people might not be the look you're going for because they'll appear very, very jumpy across the scene. You also don't want to have long periods of time in between shots when you're photographing clouds because there'll be movement will be too dramatic, too fast. However, in slow moving things such as in one of the time lapses we'll be doing shortly, which is on the rising tide, that happens over an extended period of time. So the shooting interval will definitely, definitely be increased. We've then got number of shots, the total number of photographs you want to have in your time lapse. Now I always use a frame rate of 24 frames per second when creating videos. So for my time lapses, I know that one second of video footage requires 24 photographs. Therefore, if I want the time lapse to be 10 seconds long, I set this to capture 240 photographs. 24 times 10. For a 20 second time lapse, I set this to capture 480 photographs, 24 by 20, and so on. Now there's a great mobile phone app called Time Lapse Calculator that is really handy for working out how many photographs you need depending on how long you want the final time lapse to be or how long you need to be taking photographs for creating a time lapse which is over an extended period of time, such as the incoming tide as I've already mentioned. Now there's one more thing that I want to mention about camera settings before we go running out wanting to create our time lapses. I've already talked about using manual mode and that's where we're gonna control the ISO, the shutter speed and the aperture of the camera so that we get a consistent exposure across all the photographs that are taken. And like I've said, that is massively important if you're doing uh, time lapses outside where the lighting of the day is gonna change over the time that you're taking those pictures. Now, when you're using the aperture, my recommendation, and this is what you'll find a lot across lots of time-lapse forums and what have you, is not to shoot any narrower than f8. Now, if you start going to maybe f11, f16, f22, you can potentially introduce something mechanical into your pictures, which is going to affect the final look of your time-lapse. So when you're taking your photographs, if this, if this was just like one photograph that you were taking, this would not be a problem. However, when we're taking a large number of photographs, and if we are using something like F11, it's possible, and it does happen, that every time that picture is taken, as the shutter closes, it can close ever so slightly differently on each shot. So it might not close as much on one shot 
than it did on the other and so on and so on and so on. And the fact that that mechanical difference in how much that shutter closes or not, the fact that that happens, it can have an effect on the light in your pictures. So that when you basically go to view the time lapse, you put it all together, you look at all these hundreds of photographs in the video format, you'll notice a flickering going on. And it really, really ruins the time lapse. It is so obvious. To fix that, you can require extra software, which we don't really want to have to go and do, buy more stuff, when we can just get it right the first time and use what we've already got. So stick to F8, 5.6, whatever. Try not to go to F11. It might be okay with your camera, but what you don't wanna do is go to a location, spend several hours there, you know, capturing something that's a slow moving thing, such as a riding, rising tide. And then when you go back and you import these hundreds of images and you export the video to look at it, you got that flickering, that's gonna really, really annoy you. So to be on the safe side, manual mode, manual focus, and don't go any, any narrower than F8. All right, so we're good to go. We've got our camera. We know the kind of settings that we need. We've got our tripod. Let's get out and create a really simple time lapse. All right, so to kick things off, I've brought us to a place called Exmoor in the UK, which is on the borders. Where we are at the moment is right on the border of the counties of Somerset and Devon. And it is just the most amazing location. We're quite high up here looking down into the valley and we've got this amazing little river as it kind of snakes through. We've got clouds in the distance. We've got sheep in one side. We've got birds of prey flying around. It is an amazing, amazing place. So what I want to do is just a time lapse um, to show kind of what the eyes don't see. Because when you stood here, I mean, there's hardly any wind whatsoever. There's clouds in the sky, but it doesn't look as if there's any kind of movement. But when we do a time lapse over a period of maybe I don't know, 30 minutes, something like that. You're gonna see when you play it back, how there is movement. You're gonna see sheep in the distance moving around. You can see shadows from the sun coming through the clouds on the ground as it moves. You're gonna see all kinds of stuff. And this is just such great fun to put into a video. I might even get the drone out just to create a video that's maybe, I don't know, a minute and a half. And this time that's can form part of that video. But I've got my composition looking down to the valley. And let's just get the camera here. Let's just check that our settings are all going to be okay. So I've dialed in the settings that I want. I'm going to use the compass, not the compass. I'm going to use the, uh, the level in the camera to make sure the camera's nice and level. So let's just dive in and have a look at some of the settings, making sure that everything's going to be just right for this. So uh, we'll go over to my format making sure that I'm gonna be in the 16 by nine, the widescreen format, because I want to put this into a short video. Uh, we're gonna capture them in raw, uh, uncompressed, uh, because storage these days is just, the price of it has come down, it really, really has. So rather than me shooting it in JPEG, I'm gonna shoot it in raw so that I can have much more control over the editing process. Uh, and then we're gonna dive over to uh, where we can do the interval shooting, the time lapsing. So let's have a look here then. So a uh, uh, number of shots. So I think if I do something that's gonna be, I don't know, let's create a time lapse that's gonna be maybe 20 seconds long. Now, if I'm doing a video frame rate, if my final video is gonna have 24 frames per second, I know that's 240 frames that I need for 10 seconds, which is 480 frames for 20 seconds. So let's just dial that in. We'll dive into here and I'll do 480. Uh, shooting interval, how long do I want in between the photos? Now, although it looks like not much is happening, I'm not gonna leave it a really long time like you're gonna see in the next time-lapse we do where we're looking at the tide uh, rising. But I don't know, maybe for clouds, let's say five seconds. So five seconds in between each shot. So let's just dial that in. So we'll go for five seconds. And shooting start time, that's the time where once I've activated the shutter, once I step away from the camera, it's then gonna do a countdown and then start. And that's really good if there's any kind of movement as you're touching the camera here, a little bit of wobble. So when you release it, it gives the camera time to settle down and then start taking the photos. 
and I've got the camera firmly planted on a tripod, quite, you know, a carbon fiber tripod, it's quite heavy duty. There's not much wind, so we're not gonna get much buffering on the, on the camera as well when it's kind of the wind's knocking it around. So we've got um, five second start time, shooting interval of five seconds, 480 shots, that's looking good. Now I'm gonna go into manual focus and let's just make sure now that um, I'm getting focused on an area. Let's have a look here. So I'm going for F8, uh, dialing my settings. Let's just do that just there. That's looking good. Dial this in. I do love being able to sort of dial this in manually where you can actually check with this focus peaking. Does make life a lot easier. But that's looking good. All right, so what I've got to do now then is just press, you know, for the car to go by, just press the shutter button, step back, let the camera settle down, and then it's going to kind of go through the shots. And what's great is you can see that the actual tally builds up. So it says one stroke, 480, and that kind of keeps increasing the more shots that it takes. So I'm now going to leave that to do its thing. And just one thing to be careful of is the ground that you're on. Although you put the tripod firmly into the ground, I mean, here I'm on grass and it's a little bit spongy. So I've got to be careful not to stand too close to the tripod because that sponginess might affect where the legs are. So I'm gonna step away and just let it crack on. And I think while it's doing its thing, I'll just go and grab a coffee and uh, let it do it. <laughs> So that's the time lapse completed. That's 480 photographs, 480 frames, which should give me a 20 second uh, time lapse if I put it into a video that is 24 frames per second. Uh, that took 40 minutes to do. It's not a bad place just to spend 40 minutes um, just waiting for that to happen. Um, so that's it. That's all there is to it. Nice and simple. Been really interesting to see now what this looks like with regards to the clouds. Because like I said, when you just look at it with the naked eye now, there's hardly any wind here. It doesn't look like there's much movement, but it's amazing what time lapses can reveal. So let's now dive over back into uh, the office where we can put this together to show you what it actually looks like. All right, so now the really exciting part, we're back in the office, ready to put the time-lapse together. So I've already put the memory card into the computer and imported all 480 images into Lightroom. So now I can get on with doing some edits to give them the look that I want to have. Before we do that though, just to very, very quickly mention that when I do go out and do time-lapses, invariably I'm out doing still images as well. And I'm doing a time-lapse as some extra content to put into maybe a video. So what I don't want to have is my still images mixed in with all the hundreds of still images that are going to make up the time lapse. So what I always do is create a new folder in the camera just before I start doing the time lapse. So from then on, when I do take the time lapse, all those images are separated and they're actually put into that folder away from everything else. If I then go on to do some other kind of stuff, maybe another time lapse, maybe some still images, I'll create a new folder each time. It just helps to keep everything very organized and makes it much easier to organize what pictures it is for doing what with later on when you're back in your office or your room and uh, doing your editing. But let's now dive into Lightroom so I can show you what we've got. So here in Lightroom, then you can see on the left-hand side, I've got my 2021 folder and I've got my Exmoor time-lapse. And here are all the images that we uh, took when I was out on Exmoor to do this particular time-lapse of the clouds. And you can see if I scroll all the way to the bottom, 
here we've got all 480. Now this is the great thing about importing all of your images into Lightroom because now you can start to do an edit. Just change them rather than having your device capture and create your time lapse. This means that you can really finesse it to make it look exactly how you want it to look. So I'm gonna to go to the very first image and let's have a look. We're in the develop module and I'm gonna go over to the right hand side, first of all, where we've got the profile. Now by default, that's just set at Adobe Color and I'm just gonna change that now to landscape. And when we click on landscape, you can see straight away the difference is fantastic. It really starts to bring out the colors in that kind of, um, in the heather, in the sky, the fields in the distance. So if we go from Adobe Color, which is really quite flat, take it to Adobe Landscape, massive difference. Now I'm not gonna do a heck of a lot to this, these pictures, I don't even really need to do that. But what I will do is we'll now go to the uh, Details tab and I'll just add a bit of sharpening. By default, we're at 40. I'll leave it at the default and I'll just mask it out. We'll hold down the uh, Option key on Mac, Alt key on Windows, drag the slider all the way to the right hand side just so that we can get the sharpening in the, the actual uh, ground itself not in the sky don't really need it in the sky because that's going to be uh, it's quite, quite low contrast there's not much detail in there so we'll go for that just there's good now the clouds you remember on the day that uh, when we were out doing this time lapse it was hardly any wind and the clouds although there were them they were incredibly soft and just kind of really spread out there was no kind of clumps that were really going to be dramatically moving around so this is the kind of look that we've got here this kind of sky full of this white fluff so i need to make this a little bit more uh, impactful so it's a bit more obvious so i think what i'll do is i'm going to come over here and we're going to get a uh, gradient so i'll click on the gradient Let's make sure that the uh, exposure remains the same. Don't need any change in there, but I am gonna boost up the clarity. And then we'll just come over into the top of our image, click and drag downwards. Let's have a look just there. In the bottom left, we've got the show selected mask overlay. I've put a little tick in there. You can see that this red overlay appears over exactly where it is that I'm gonna be affecting the sky. So just there, because obviously we don't need to come too far down, but we'll just bring it just onto the horizon just there. That's great. Okay, so now look, you see I can play around with the clarity. That's going to bring some detail into there. The D Hay slider, fantastic for clouds. Just got to be careful not to go too far, make them a bit too blue and too electric. That just wouldn't look realistic, but we can certainly bring in a little bit more detail into there. Something like that. Yeah, I think, do you know, I think that's pretty much all that we need to do with this. So we'll come out of the uh, gradient, but now that we've got this uh, first image, uh, edited here we can see the icons in the bottom left hand corner of the thumbnail saying that there's edits on this what I will now do whilst that image is highlighted or that thumbnail is highlighted I'm now going to scroll down all the way to the very bottom where the final image is I'm going to hold down my shift key and then click so now all of the actual thumbnails all of the frames for this uh, time lapse are now highlighted and then in the bottom right hand corner sync settings We'll click on sync settings and we'll do check all so that we don't physically have to go and click and uh, choose the ones that we did. Might as well just say click all, uh, check all. So do that, click synchronize and then top left hand corner you'll see now the progress bar is basically telling you that it's now applying those edits to every single one of your, uh, every single one of your images. So now look, when we go through them, if we just click on that very first image, let's go to the survey mode now, and we can click through them using the right arrow key, you can see that all of those images, even though down the bottom they're being selected, you can see that the edit is consistent throughout them. But now that we've done that, let's get all of these images out now into, uh, onto our desktop or an area on our computer so that we can then dive into something like Photoshop or Premiere, we'll talk about which one to use and why you'd want to use them in a moment. But first of all, let's now, now that we've done the edits, let's get them out of Lightroom, get them into a folder, then dive into whatever software we're going to use to finally create the time lapse. So we'll go to the file menu, we'll go to export, and what we'll do, we'll choose where we want them to go. So let's just put this on my desktop, let's just do here, and we'll go new folder, and we'll call this Xmore time lapse and click create and choose that's where they're going to go to and i've got a couple of presets built into here whether i want the longest edge of each of the pictures because you remember we actually shot it in 16 9 the widescreen ratio 
However, that doesn't mean to say that they're going to be all 1920 by 1080 pixels, which is what the widescreen is. They're going to come in in that sort of um, orientation. They're going to be huge, but we need to scale them down. So I'm going to say, let's just keep it simple. We'll get these all out to be 1920 by 1080. And you see, if I scroll down here, all I've done is image sizing, resize all of these images when you export them so that the longest edge is 1920 pixels, which is the long edge in a high definition video. All right, so we'll do that. We'll click export. The progress bar in the top will start to kick in as it starts to export the images. So we can just sit back because this could take some time depending on how many images you've got. We've got 480, but let's just zip forward and then we can crack on in the actual putting the time lapse together. All right, so we've now exported all 480 images from Lightroom as JPEGs into a folder on our desktop. And if we just look at the desktop now, if I uh, open this folder up, we can see all here are the images. And if I just click on the first one here and just right click and choose Get Info, you can see we've got the dimensions here, 1920 by 1080. You'll remember when we first captured these images, I chose the 16 by nine aspect ratio for a high definition which is 1920 by 1080. And obviously then, because I've captured those files that size, when I then export them from Lightroom to tell Lightroom, the longest edge needs to be 1920 pixels. That's why the short edge comes out at 1080 pixels. But just coming back into here, then let's just close that down. Let's close that one down and let's open up Photoshop just to show the really simple process for creating a time lapse. All we need to do is go to the file menu, choose open, and then we just navigate to the folder where we've got our time-lapse images. And that's on my desktop. I'll click on the very first one and you can see when I do that, right at the bottom where it says format is JPEG, there's a little checkbox now which has come up called image sequence. Now, if I put a little tick in there, Photoshop now knows that all of the images within this folder form part of a sequence of pictures that need to be used in the time-lapse. So I put a little tick in there, click on open, and when I do, it then asks me what frame rate do you want to use? Now, I told you when I was capturing them that I like to work in 24 frames per second, but you might be someone that works in a different frame rate. If you are putting this video into another one, this time-lapse into another video. Uh, but if you wanted to change it, you just click on the menu there, you've got 25, 30, 60, whatever. Choose whatever frame rate you like to work in. I'll then click OK and it opens up the first image. It doesn't really look like a time lapse or a video at the moment, but if we go to the window menu and then choose timeline, you can see now we have this video timeline and the play button over on the left hand side. So if I click on that play button, you'll now see uh, a little bit of movement going on from what we captured. Admittedly, it's not that dramatic because you remember at the time, the clouds were very, very thin out, thinned out, very low contrast, very fluffy, uh, and it was just no wind at all. So you can see a little bit of stuff going on there and a little bit of the shadows going across the ground. Although, like I say, not massively dramatic. However, I did go back to that location again. So let me just dive back in and I'll open that sequence of images up so you can see what it would look like if there was, you know, some dramatic kind of clouds in the scene, brighter lights and shadow and what have you. So let me just close those down. We'll go don't save and we'll go at file and open. And I'll just navigate to a folder on my computer where I've got the other visit that I had. Click on the first image, click on image sequence and then click on open. 24 frames per second and we'll click OK. So here we have our first image. You can see already much more uh, cloud in the sky. There's gaps in there. It's a lot brighter as well. So if I now click play and I do remember it was a much windier day. So the clouds were visibly moving. Forget the time lapse. I could see them moving. But click play. Now you can see much more dramatic. Now, when you view the time-lapse images within Photoshop, it's gonna look a little bit jumpy, and that's because you haven't rendered it out yet. It's kind of doing it to show you a preview of what it'd be like within Photoshop. So to actually get the uh, time-lapse out of Photoshop onto your computer so that you can use it elsewhere and upload it into a, an, onto a social media or put within a video, all you need to do is go to the File menu, choose Export, and then Render Video. That'll then take you through the steps to export it to wherever you want to in whatever format, uh, and then you can start to play it. So I'm just gonna quickly click on that now, um, and then now I wanna actually just play you what it looks like 
once you've exported it and it's within a video running smoothly, not rendering. All right, so in this second time lapse, I want to show you how we would go about doing a time lapse over an extended period of time. So rather than sort of 15, 20, 30 minutes, we're talking a number of hours. And in this case, where I was creating a time lapse of the rising tide at a nearby harbour, it meant the camera taking pictures for about four, four and a half hours. So obviously, with that comes a lot more planning. But the main thing that I planned with this one was getting to know when was the high tide expected to be. And it just so happened it was around about five past eight in the evening. So both me and my wife got on location nice and early so I could find the perfect spot for a great composition. We got there about sort of five, six hours earlier. Um, but there are things to consider when you're going to be there for a number of time. And I would say really when you're going to do that, you want to go with somebody else. Have a friend there because not only is it all about making things nice and safe if you're seen to be hanging around an area with a lot of expensive kit for a number of a number of hours, but also it's little convenience things like maybe if one of you needs to pop to the toilet, one of you can stay with the kit while the other one goes off. And obviously somebody else can go and get some food, you can get some drinks, you can share the time out so it makes it much more an enjoyable experience. But one thing I also did when I was there I've also tied a uh, orange reflective tabard around one of the legs of the tripod because although I was there with a red coat on, people did still get a little bit too close and a little bit curious. And just by having that tabard on there, there's something official about it that makes people keep back. So that's one thing to consider. Now, being there for a number of hours, it meant, right, I needed to work out how many photographs am I going to need to take and for what's the duration going to be in between each photograph. So that was just a case of diving into the time lapse calculator app again, but just changing the settings so that it was able to tell me uh, how many pictures I need to take for a particular period of time. So I've obviously put in how long I'm going to be doing it, which was four hours. That then told me if I have a gap of roughly 15 seconds, which was probably about right for something like this, it then showed me I need to take 960 photographs. When you put those settings into the camera, into the interval settings within the camera, that then is great because at the bottom it shows you how long you're going to be photographing for, so it confirms everything between the camera and the app. So taking pictures for four hours, we also need to think about battery life because the camera is remaining on for that period of time taking photographs. It's pretty likely that your battery, depending on what camera you're using, could drain. And the last thing you want after all this planning and traveling there is for your battery to go midway. So one thing which is just the best for time-lapse photographers is this thing here. This is made by a company called Tether Tools and it's called the Case Relay. And basically what this does is, on one end of it here, you can get your, like what they call a dummy battery. So that would fit into the battery compartment on your camera. The case relay, you will then plug into a power bank. Now this is one I've got here made by Anchor. Uh, plug this in, and the great thing about this was, even though I was photographing for sort of like four, four and a half hours, it used literally a quarter of the, battery, of the, the power within this battery pack. Now the great thing about the case relay is if you are doing really extended um, time lapses or maybe the battery in your power bank isn't quite as good as what maybe this one is, I don't know. Um, if the battery starts to go on your power bank, you can unplug it from the case relay. But the case relay will keep your camera powered so that it can continue to take photographs while you then swap out and put another fully charged power bank back on to keep everything going, which I thought was just fantastic. So that is definitely a uh, time-lapse photographer's gift when it comes to keeping your battery and your camera working. So that's that. And also for this particular shoot, because we had the bright sky with all the clouds in it, but they had my dark areas down in the harbour where the boats were, uh, I ended up using a graduated neutral density filter. I think it was like three stops. That way, when it's on the front of the camera, it can keep detail in the sky when I just dial in the settings on the camera that allow me to have a little bit more detail in the darker parts in the harbour. And you can see here as well, I shot this at f5.6, so that way I'm not going to get any kind of mechanical um, 
interference within the actual pictures. It's going to be brighter and darker and get that flickering, which I mentioned about earlier on. And you can see here, actually, the focus peaking I mentioned earlier on, where all the red bits are what's going to be in focus once I've manually dialed it in. So once all that was uh, up and running, it was a case of just pressing the shutter, activating it, stepping back and then the camera do its thing. Obviously sitting there for a good few hours, we, we had, a, had a nice day. We had fish and chips, we had ice creams. It made it for a great, great occasion. So uh, we'll jump forward now. We'll jump over into Lightroom so I can show you all those images that were captured. All right, so all of those images now from Lymouth have been imported into Lightroom. Uh, you can see actually it says 732. The reason for that is because if I just scroll all the way down here, when we get to image 732, the light was falling fast, the high tide was well and truly in, so I wasn't really gaining anything by letting the camera to continue taking pictures, another 228 pictures. You just wouldn't have seen it, so I just stopped the camera there and then. But all these images now, I've done a little bit of an edit on the very first image, just a quick edit just so that we know what we're kind of uh, you know, going by what we did last time. Uh, this image here, I've literally just uh, decreased the highlights because when the highlights were at normal, we, got, we lost detail in the sky. So I've brought that down a bit, added a gradient as well. And when that gradient, just reducing the exposure a little bit. Again, that brings in a little bit more, bit more detail of the sky, used a bit of clarity and a little bit of dehaze, which is great for skies. Although if you use it too much, again, it makes it a little bit too electric, which just doesn't look real. Something like that. And then also just a slight increase in the color temperature. So we're taking just a little bit warmer, something like that. Once I'd edited that image, it was then a case of once it's highlighted, scrolling down to the very last image, holding down the shift key, clicking on that, and then using that sync settings command so that all those settings then are applied to all the images going across it. Obviously you could spend a lot more time editing each of these because this particular time lapse goes from day to night. So you might wanna edit them in batches just a slightly different way because of the way that light changes. But once that's done, we then just simply go to the file menu, choose export, and then we'll just export those out from Lightroom like we did last time with the very first time lapse. We'll get them out into a folder, but this time rather than using Photoshop, we're going to bring them into Premiere Pro, which is my favorite way of creating time lapses. OK, so I've now got uh, Premiere Pro open. So all I'm going to do is click on New Project. And I'll just call this uh, Linmouth Time Lapse. And I'll put this just on my desktop for now. So let's just navigate to the desktop. And we'll click Choose. And then we'll click OK. This brings us into the main workspace for uh, Premiere Pro. I'm then going to hold down the Command key on Mac or Control key on Windows and press the letter I on my keyboard to import all the images for the time lapse. Here's the folder where we've got them. I click on the very first one, but you'll notice this time there is no checkbox for image sequence. That's because in Premiere Pro, I just need to click on Options and then it appears. I can put a little tick in there so that Premiere treats all of the images in the folder as uh, they're needed because they are forming part of the time lapse. We click on import, very quickly brought into Premiere Pro down the left hand corner. We can then click on this, drag it into the sequence here to create a new sequence. And you can see, there we go. There's our first image and we can scroll across with the timeline to see what the progress of that timeline uh, time lapse looks like. Now we, uh, I created this in 24 frames per second, so that's how it's gotta be viewed. So I'll always go to the sequence menu at the top of Premiere Pro, click on sequence settings, and just make sure in here where it says time base, uh, we are working in 24 frames per second. That's what we wanna do for this, and then click OK. So then once it's rendered, it will run perfectly smoothly. Now this is great because now I can just move along this timeline. We can see how it's uh, how it's going to look as it goes from day to night. But what I love about Premiere Pro is the flexibility it gives you to do so much more with the time lapse because obviously it's a video editing bit of kit. Now I mentioned way back about using sliders, how you can introduce intentional movement within your uh, time lapses, where your camera could be panning from left to right, up and down, or at an angle. I'm going to introduce a little bit of that now, but I'm going to fake it. I'm going to do it in Premiere Pro, really, really easy to do. And I'm going to make it look as if the camera is moving forward into where the boats are as the time lapse is going on. Very, very simple to do. 
So in Premiere, I'm gonna get the timeline, I'm gonna drag it all the way to the very, very end, just to where the final image is there. Then I'm gonna come up to the left-hand side where we've got the effects controls, put a little tick where it says scale, and that adds a point onto the timeline, just there. So I can now change the scale, and you'll notice as I change the scale, if you look over on the right-hand side, we're changing the scale of the video. Now I'll bring it up just so that this building over here on the right-hand side is just out of frame. So we'll go for something like that. So that takes us to 154% as opposed to being the regular 100% viewing. I'll then get the uh, timeline, drag it all the way to the left, right to the very start of the video, and then I'll come back to this scale and just change it back to 100. And that there adds a little pointer. So now we've got this pointer here saying 100, this one's saying 150. And as the video moves through, as it goes from point A to point B, it gradually increases so that by the end of it, it is at that 154% or whatever it was. And that's gonna give the idea of the camera moving in because everything's getting closer towards the viewer. You can kind of see it as I drag the timeline just a little bit. You can see there's a little bit of movement being introduced, but you'll see it a lot better once it's been exported. So how do we export it? We just go to the file menu and we choose export media. And obviously this isn't a class all about Premiere Pro, I just wanna show you how you can get them out, uh, but we'll just give it a name. Let's just click on here on the right-hand side and we'll call this Linmouth, uh, T-I-M-E-L-A-P-S-E, time-lapse. Don't know why I spelled that out for you, but hey, there you go. Uh, and we'll have that on the desktop, we'll click save. Uh, we'll change the actual dimensions of it here. Let's just go for normal time, uh, normal widescreen, 1920 by 1080-ish, something like that. Uh, well, let's have a little scroll down. We'll just leave the bit rate encoding, just leave that at VBR one pass. Let's just get this out so you can see what it's like. Uh, and there we go, just click on export in the bottom right-hand corner and jobs are good. All right, so there you go. Now, before I kind of show you once more that Linmouth time lapse put together with all the drone footage and the music, which I had great fun doing, I just want to just want to wrap this up to say that time lapses are a heck of a lot of fun. If you've never done them before, I really do encourage you to get and do some because not only are they fun, but they also guarantee you getting content. And that's one thing I've learned by doing more of them over the past 12 months whilst we've been living under these kind of restrictions to some degree or another because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Getting out sometimes when you're going to do a photo shoot can be a little bit disheartening when you don't come back with the result that you wanted. But the great thing about time lapses is you go out to do a time lapse, you're gonna get some content no matter what. So I really do encourage you to get out and I'm, I'm really excited. Hopefully you'll keep in touch. Let me know how you're getting on and what kind of time lapses do you create? I mean, really experiment with this. I mean, I'm gonna go out at some point and do a time-lapse of people when they're on like maybe like on a beach, loads of people walking around, but at a much slower shutter speed. So then you get that kind of blurring kind of effect. And when you play it back at full speed, it'll look like they're kind of like racing around on the beach, but they'll have like a trail behind them. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. But tomorrow morning, I'm gonna be getting out to do a time-lapse on, um, I'm gonna say a plant, but it's really a weed in our garden, a dandelion that I've noticed. This morning when I was going out having a coffee, I noticed that it was just starting to open up. So I didn't realize these things close down at night and open up in the morning. So I'm gonna get up early to set up a time-lapse. Obviously I'll have to use that case relay because it'd be going for a while. I wanna do a time-lapse of that opening. And if you wanna check out the results of that, here's the web address I'll post it up at. So it's just glendewis.com forward slash dandelion dash time-lapse. But there you go. I really hope that's uh, gonna encourage you to get out there and have a, a bit of a go at doing some time lapses. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me at glynn at glynnjewis.com. But for now, I'm gonna leave you to go and enjoy the rest of the great classes by some really cool folks at the Lightroom Virtual Summit. And I will play out with my Linmouth time lapse. <laughs>